It's done. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Life Bible study. It's great to have everybody here in the fellowship hall. Uh, Jill and Reverend Art at home, and those of you that may be watching later on uh, as it's recorded and posted on YouTube. We are starting a brand new study on Ezekiel, and uh, another great, uh, there's history involved here, there's the prophetic word, and uh, there's plenty of application for us as Christians uh, living out our life in exile uh, in this sinful world, broken world here today. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's turn now to our opening hymn. Christ the Lord is risen today because it is still Easter, everybody. start a bible study or what it was a fast one <laughs> yeah it's like usually they give you a chance to breathe the good no. verses but it's <laughs> almost like but i know shouldn't it i given, like it given the subject matter shouldn't it be mm -hmm. upbeat it is right now. let's continue on the... let's continue on with our uh time of worship here and uh Written on the stream here. We're going to read uh, the Detroit, which is actually for Easter Sunday, which I did not include as part of our Easter Sunday celebration. So this is kind of into you. I do the uh, light font and you respond in the dark font. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You will bring them in 
and plant them on your own mountain. A place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your the sanctuary, O oh Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. A little extra credit here. What are we talking about? Why is that in for Easter Sunday? This is not exactly an Easter story, is it? The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. What, what's going on there? What is that talking about? Devil. Exodus. 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 Moses. And what, what story from Exodus? The Egyptians were covered with the ocean. The parting of the Red Sea? Yep. They were marching through on dry ground. And then once they were through, the Egyptians followed. The Lord made their chariots get stuck in the mud. So what's the connection here with Easter? Israel was redeemed out of Egypt. Washing away, cleansing of the options it, it, it's a great story of salvation, totally by the hands of the Lord. Israel did nothing, right? They simply obeyed God. They marched through. They didn't have to fight against Egypt. And now here, finally, Pharaoh and all those that would chase after him die. A fresh start. A fresh start. And so how does that connect with Jesus' resurrection? We have a fresh start. Yeah. As we sang in our hymn, sin has been canceled. The devil has been defeated. Our greatest enemy. Sin, death, and the devil defeated. And that's what we take from the resurrection. That's proof positive. As Jesus rose again, so will you. And so will I. Because even though we have a death in this world, it has now become a doorway into eternal life. Our sin taken to the cross, never to be held against us. Death defeated. So the devil can't claim us because he has no sin to his himself. Christ continues to wash it away. And you're right, Al, uh, the, Red, the Red Sea has always been a sign of baptism. The washing away of all that would hurt us and condemn us. It's like the Lord's Lord says, for he has triumphed gloriously. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps we maybe forget that part of Easter, but it is a triumph, glorious triumph celebration. And that's why it continues on for seven Sundays. We don't just stop for one Sunday, which I love in, in liturgical churches. We, I don't remember doing that in Presbyterian church. Easter was done and over with and you moved on. And uh, they went back to preaching how you needed to be better as a God. And, and we continue to preach that God's already made you better and continues to make you better through word and sacrament. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we do come before you and we continue to celebrate your resurrection victory, dear Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for doing what we could never do on our own and thank you for the message that comes clear to us, that it is done, that we don't have to continue to try to be better in your eyes to be saved. We want to obey you out of love because of all you've done for us. And that obedience continues to be marked with failures and faults, but you continue to forgive. In our heart and in our mind, may your grace always triumph and rule over our sin, over the accusations of the devil, reminding us we indeed truly are free. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord God, be with all of those amongst us who are mourning, including Fred Wass and his family, uh, Melissa Metcalf, Connie Rao, uh, Jill Bailey, and also the Burr family. Grant them comfort as they mourn the passing of loved ones, boistered and assured because of the resurrection victory and what it means for their loved ones and what it means for us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, prayer. Lord God, we give thanksgiving on behalf of Cheryl for all of the doors that you opened for her to relocate here in Michigan. Continue to watch over her and provide for her and whatever lies in front of her. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with uh, Cheryl's uncle, Ellie's brother, who's recovering from a broken ankle and surgery to fix that. 
May his recovery be quick. May your hand be apparent and may he be restored completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, God be with Tony, uh, who's in Genesis Hospital for with an upper rep respiratory virus. Grant him complete health and healing, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, God be with the with the Keel family, with Betty, with Bill, with Joe, and the entire family as they suffer through COVID. Keep your healing hand and watchful care over Bill. May he not be, may somebody be watching over him every day and providing for him. Restore them all to health so they can continue to carry on and, and be a comfort at Betty's side. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with Terry and Greg as they travel up north. Give them safe travels up there, a wonderful time, and safe travels back. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Lord God, be with all those who are affected by the wildfires in New Jersey and in Colorado. Work with the first responders, the fire department to try to put those fires out. Be with any that have lost lives, lives of loved ones, buildings and property. We ask that you would contain those fires and protect people from getting, uh, more people from getting affected. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Lord God, be with Connie as she uh, faces surgery tomorrow. Be with our sister Rita as she, she faces surgery today. We ask that uh, you would be with the hands of the doctors and nurses that these procedures would go without complications, their recovery to be quick and as painless as possible. Restore them both to health. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, I thank you for the rest and the recuperation and, and just the strength of faith that you've provided me in my life over these last couple of days. Thank you for blessing our Easter worship. Continue to give me blessings physically, emotionally, and spiritually so I can be your shepherd here in this place. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord God, we ask you would be with all those who have been hurt families of those who were killed in that parking garage disaster in New York. Work with the first responders there and those that come behind to clean up. Grant them all your love, your patience, and your support. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Lord. Lord God, be with us as we turn now to this Bible study. We ask that you and uh, Holy Spirit would descend upon us and, and help us to learn and to hear. And Lord, draw other people to attend with us. Uh, encourage them to be involved in your word and that Bible study is a joy and not a task and not homework. Help me to present this Bible study with that in mind. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. All God's people respond. Uh, Amen. We now pray the uh, collect, collect of the day. Almighty God, the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death by sin, of sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are starting on day one. And we're going to read through 2 Kings 24, 25. I know it's not Ezekiel, but to understand Ezekiel, we need a little bit of the historical context in which he is writing. Again, I will give you a short little introduction as part of uh, the leader's part of this Bible study. Ezekiel is a challenging book to study and apply. To fully understand this prophet, we need to know his historical context, the style of his writing, and some major theological themes in his book. When the prophet Daniel, and you remember him, he has his own book, which we would be good to study sometime. When the prophet Daniel looked out his window in Babylon at morning, noon, and evening, he could reflect on what he had suddenly left behind. He had grown up with the holy temple of Jerusalem always in line of sight. It was the city's greatest feature in the skyline. Now the Judeans were forced from their homeland. They had to replace the times of temple sacrifice with times of prayer. They would not give up their faith in the Lord, even though Jerusalem was now a far-off memory. Daniel paid no attention to these hostile rivals in Babylon who stopped him, ready to convince the ruler that Daniel's prayer was subversive and illegal. Daniel kept praying anyway, looking west toward Jerusalem, possibly wondering if he would ever see that holy city again. Not far away from Daniel, in one of the many Israelite settlements in the land of exile, Ezekiel also cast his thoughts toward the promised land. God had taken centuries 
to warn his rebellious people that he would judge them. This time had finally come to fulfill his threat of punishment. Now it seemed that they would know nothing except God's anger. Faithful Israel would have to live with a constant reminder that too many of their countrymen followed the gods of other nations. God used powerful foreign nations to exact his vengeance, along with other priests, leaders, and influential people. This young prophet-to-be had to be rounded up by King Nebuchadnezzar's army, ensuring that he would not see the temple again. Just like Daniel, praying and looking westward, Ezekiel knew that he had no reason to expect a return to his Judean homeland. There was yet a third prophet who was alive at this time, Jeremiah. Unlike Daniel and Ezekiel, Jeremiah was left behind in Jerusalem. So as we go through and, and read uh, mm -hmm. the opening part of the study, we're also going to read from Jeremiah. And then eventually we'll get to Ezekiel. So let's begin now in uh, 2 Kings. We're going to start in... Uh, Chapter 23. 23? Yeah. Verse 34. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction here. <clears throat> this has to do with <clears throat> the, the Judean king Jehoiakim. This is at the end of the reign of the kings of Judah. As we've already read, Babylon's going to come in, he's going to, and Babylon is going to, in stages, destroy the city and take everyone. Yeah. So we're going to start with this King Jehoiakim. The period of Jehoiakim's reign saw an important shift in the world power. Four years after Josiah's death, and Josiah was the last good king of Israel. Four years after, at Megiddo, Pharaoh Necho was involved in a battle with the Babylonian army up north at the Euphrates River. So you have two world powers at this time, Egypt in the south and Babylon, which is over to the east. But they would come from the north because that's the Fertile Crescent. You follow the Euphrates River around and then come down. You can't just march straight across. That's all desert. So you have Babylonians coming from the north and Egypt coming up to the south. Two world powers. It's a world war at that time. So Pharaoh Necho from, uh, was involved in a battle with the Babylonian army up north at the Euphrates River. Necho and the Assyrians were soundly defeated at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. Assyria had been a world power. They're waning. Babylon is, can you, this is how strong Babylon is. They defeat two other great world powers, Assyria and Egypt fighting against them, and Babylon wins. A young Babylonian prince named Nebuchadnezzar the man destined to become the next king of Babylon, led the Babylonians to victory. For the next 90 years, Israel's history would be intertwined with that of Babylon, now the dominant power ancient Near East. Somebody like to begin reading in 2 Kings chapter 23. Uh, read it from verse 34 all the way to 24, verse 7. And Pharaoh Neto made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. 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 But he took Jehoaz, Jehoaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. A little bit of, of history here. Uh, Josiah, the good king of Israel or of Judah, for whatever reason, he was a good king up until he decided to go out and fight Necho. And uh, this was actually part of our, uh, our uh, should have been part of your midweek Bible study, midweek Lent service. Nico said, hey, the Lord has sent me out there to fight. Don't come up against me. So here's God speaking through a nation that may or may not be obedient to him. And Josiah doesn't listen. He goes, <laughs> he fights, he loses. So at that point now, Egypt now rules over Judah. Judah is no longer independent. They're a vassal state. Or Pharaoh, Nico, and Egypt. All right, brother, continue on. But he took Jehoaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh. But he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of the Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land from everyone according to his assessment to give it to Pharaoh, Nico. Jehoiakim 
was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years at Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebedee, and the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. I'll continue. Yeah, through verse 7. Okay. And in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the Ammonites and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight. For the, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the deeds of Jehoi Jehoiakim and all that he did are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiasin, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come again out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook to the Egypt of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Very good. Thank you. So... By this time, the northern kingdom is gone. Uh, this is around 609 BC that this takes place. A hundred years earlier, Assyria had come in and taken the northern kingdom captive. Assyria was an evil, godless nation sent by God. And that was part of the emphasis here. If you're not going to obey me, I'll send heathens worse than you to destroy you. And he did. And Assyria, unlike Babylon, they came in, they conquered everything, they raped the land and took the people away, but didn't keep them separate. Assyria believed if we water down their nationality, if we get rid of this whole uh, Israelite pride, we won't have to deal with them. And that's what happened. So effectively, those are the 10 tribes to the north. Those are the lost 10 tribes because they became Gentiles. That was 100 years earlier. Now you have a new world superpower, Babylon, coming down and taking control of Judah. Talk about Manasseh. Manasseh was the king after Josiah, uh, 697 to 643 BC, and he was evil. And he was so evil that at that point, the Lord said, I'm going to destroy Judah. Actually, he was before Josiah. Josiah was a breath of fresh air after him. But because Josiah was uh, a God-fearer and brought the nation back to the Lord, he relented for a time. But the Lord knows what's going to happen. And Josiah was the last good king. And his sons after him were just as evil as Manasseh. And that sealed their fate. Yeah, Manasseh was 697 to 643. Josiah came at 641 to 609. He was a good king. And he was the last one. A little comment here. After his victory at Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar marched south into the areas that had been controlled by Egypt. He beat Egypt, so now he's going to assume all the lands that Egypt had been ruling, which had been, after Josiah's battle with Egypt, that had been Judah. And the Palestine is an important land because it's a land bridge between the north and the south. So you have these forces that live at the north, Assyria and then Babylon, which comes around, and you have Egypt in the south, and there's various trade routes that go through Palestine. If you, were, if you control Palestine, you control those trade routes. So Palestine was always a contested land. Plus, it was rich and beautiful. It had a lot to offer. Everybody wanted it. So after his victory, Nebuchadnezzar marched south into the areas that had been controlled by Egypt. He also came to Jerusalem. King Jehoiakim wisely declined to fight against the Babylonians. It was at this time that Nebuchadnezzar took some young men from leading Jewish families as captives back to Babylon. These young men included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who would be trained for service in the Babylonian government. This is the first deportation. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar is going to take the best and the brightest back home so they can serve him. Also, what happens if you take the best and the brightest out of the land? They don't have anyone to lead them. 
that we make it weaker. Three years later, Jehoiakim rebelled against the Babylonians. And once again, why? Have you seen who they've defeated? Do you understand who they control? And constantly, even though Jeremiah had preached to them, don't look to Egypt, don't go to Egypt, they kept looking to Egypt, thinking that Egypt would come and save them. Egypt can't save them because they're a defeated nation too. But Jehoiakim rebels against the Babylonians. He is quickly defeated and taken in chains to Babylon together with some items from the temple. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in. Of course, he's not going to take people. He's going to take one of the funny valuables. A little comment on the sins of Manasseh. According to uh, 2 Kings 21, it included Baal worship in Jerusalem, in God's temple. Worship of the false god Baal, the rain god, which often involved temple prostitution and sometimes involved child sacrifice. Also included witchcraft, spiritism, sins, which often provide the theme for today's movies and music. So the sins of Manasseh, they're out there today. The shedding of innocent blood also continues today in America's abortion clinics. When those who claim to be God's people will not respond to God's word, but choose to live in impenitence, then God's judgment is near. Some of the people of Judah still hope to receive help from Egypt, their neighbors to the south, but this was not to be. Secular records tell us that in 588 BC, Pharaoh Necho signed a priest treaty with Nebuchadnezzar. According to its terms, Necho conceded all of Palestine including Jerusalem, to Nebuchadnezzar. In return, Nebuchadnezzar agreed to leave Egypt alone. That's why the king of Egypt's not going to march out of his own country. He signed a peace treaty, plus he knows if he does, Babylon's going to sweep in again. No. They'll do what they will end up doing. They would have done what they end up doing to Jerusalem. Questions or comments? So you had Jehoiakim, he was a son of Josiah, and now we're going to have uh, another uh, son, Jehoiachin, and he's going to begin ruling in Jerusalem. So uh, somebody wants to pick it up, 2 uh, Kings chapter 24, let's read verses 8 through 7, 8 through 7, 8 through 17, I'm sorry. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehusha, the daughter of Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the chief men of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Atania, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Yeah. Brutal, isn't it? 
So it makes the Lord sound like a, an evil, retributive God? Keep in mind, uh, they've been warned. Yeah. yeah. It's like when kids get in trouble and the parents said, if you do this, this is the consequences. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear it. They think they can do whatever they want. And then when the consequences come, you're the meanest parent in the world. Well said, Faith. The consequences that they were told would happen. I want to take a moment and turn back. I, I want to do this earlier, but let's turn to Second Chronicles 36. And uh, so that gives us a little bit of a highlight, a uh, little bit more information on what's going on here. Second Chronicles 36, and uh, we're going to read verses 5 to 11, if somebody can do that. This jumps back to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him in bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar took some of the utensils of the Lord's temple to Babylon and put them in his temple in Babylon. The rest of Jehoiakim, the detestable things he did, and what he found against him are written in the book of Israel's kings, the son of Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin became king in his place. Okay. Just a little bit about what happened. Jehoiakim marched off in brown shackles to Babylon. And you see here in this first time, Nebuchadnezzar takes some of the utensils, some of the good stuff from the temple. And from what we just read, when Jehoiakim screws up and he tries to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, what happens when Nebuchadnezzar comes then? Takes all the rest. <laughs> yeah, clean house. Kind of cleans house, doesn't he? How about the people? Took all the good people. Just yeah. the poor. Took more. In fact, who does it say was left? Just the poor. They'd probably be the uneducated and. And once again, why? Why is he doing that? To make them. No possibility of them ever becoming a war machine again. The craftsmen are gone. They can't make the swords and the metal thing. He's eliminated their power to become a superpower or any kind of power. She doesn't have to pay for the welfare and stuff. And, you know, help them. He's, he's made it so that the people that are left can't rebel. Well, why leave people there? I wouldn't want an, another bird. I mean, I would like the craftsman and stuff to help build my kingdom better, but uh, I don't want anybody that can't contribute to make my kingdom greater. I've taken the best of them and left the rest to fend for themselves. I wouldn't want them. But if you leave some people in the land, what can those people do? Well, when they when they have children and the children may, not, may be smarter than the parents, <laughs> <laughs> eventually... Just think on that. He didn't because it, it gives them pride in their in their own culture and it makes them angry. So they might want to rebel. Like, look what they did to us. But thinking of all that Nebuchadnezzar took into Babylon, what has Jerusalem and Judah become to him? To who? Nebuchadnezzar? Mm -hmm. Resource. Yeah, resource. A resource for wealth. And certainly all of the stuff he took from the temple. That's we're talking a lot of money there. Gold, silver, and bronze. But also there's the produce of the land. And if you leave the poor there, they can tend to the grapevines, the pomegranates, and continue to be a food resource for Babylon. Yeah, I forgot what you said earlier. That was part of the Fertile Crescent. That was productive agricultural area, and people need food. And I didn't think about that. Good. Like the heartland. Questions up to this point? Turn back to our reading of uh, Second Kings 
chapter 24. Let's read uh, verses 18 to 20. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Amutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem that Judah and Judah, that he cast them out of it from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the kings of Babylon. <laughs> Is it a familiar theme that keeps reoccurring and reoccurring? I'll call it the feature. Yeah. We're going to take a look at 2 Chronicles 36, 11 to 14 real quick and get some additional, uh, another point of view, additional information on this. Second Chronicles 36, 11 to 14. Zedekiah was 11 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God, and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him take an oath in God's name. He, had become, he became stiff-necked and hardened his heart. He would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more faithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations, following the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. What's different here about what Zedekiah did that would really have angered the Lord? He rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. After he had done what in the presence of God? Made a covenant. Swore allegiance. In God's name. That he would obey Nebuchadnezzar and allow him to be a vassal. To be a vassal nation. To obey and, and, and put himself under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. And we could look at Jeremiah, but in the meantime, that's what Jeremiah is telling them. Babylon's here because the Lord God sent them. And if you try to fight against Babylon, you're fighting against the Lord, and you're going to lose. Come up underneath their reign, and the Lord will allow some of you to remain in this land. And if you don't, the big hurt is coming. The big hurt is coming. There's not much left there now. It's been two deportations. More treasures taken from Jerusalem, more men. All the officials, the fighting men, the craftsmen, the artisans, 10,000 forced people left in the land. Babylon also takes the entire force of 7,000 fighting men strong and fit for war. Not much left there, but there still are some left. And this, this uncle of Jehoiachin uh, is now uh, put in charge. It's, Questions or comments? It's just one bad king after another. They And they never learn. They don't learn. No. And God is speaking to them, mercifully reaching out to them through the prophet. And Jeremiah suffered mightily for what he had to say. They didn't want to hear it, and they punished him for it. Okay, uh, let's turn now back to 2 Kings, chapter 25, and read verses uh, 1 to 7. What? Because they're not done rebelling yet. And Babylon's not done yet, and the Lord is not done yet. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works 
all around the, the city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Let's stop for a moment. What's different now? What do you notice now with Babylon coming? They build a wall or something around it. They, they shut build a seed on. wall around. And, and on. Who, who has come? Nebuchadnezzar. His entire army. army. You think they pissed Nebuchadnezzar off? A little. He comes in force. Before that, it would never have been. He didn't need to. He didn't need to send all the troops. And before that, each time they came, Israel kind of succeeded and said, okay, I'm sorry. But now this is the last stand. They had to build a siege wall around it because Israel or Judah is going to try to fight. Jerusalem is going to try to take them off. And, and Jerusalem is on a mountain. And it does have walls. Uh, that's why David wanted the city to be his capital because it was well protected. However, when you've got the entire Babylonian army and they've got a lot of knowledge and they've got siege works and they've got ways to knock down and throw things over the wall, make it a last. I'm sorry, go ahead and continue on, verse three. By the ninth day of the fourth month of the famine and the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. Then the city wall was broken through and the whole army fled at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden, through the Babylonians were surrounding the city. They fled toward the Arabah. 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 But the Babylonian army pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his all his soldiers were separated from him and scattered, and that he was captured. He was taken to the King of Babylon in Ribatha, Ribatha, where sentence was pronounced on him. They killed the sons of Zebekiah before his eyes. They had put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. On the seventh day of the fifth Let's month. We'll stop right there. Good. So the siege of Jerusalem started. Uh, in Zedekiah's ninth, in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth month, and it went until Zedekiah's eleventh year. So, how long? The ninth year to the eleventh year? Two years. Mm -hmm. Year and a half to two years long. That's how long the siege lasted. And during that time, do you think any kind of food could get into Jerusalem? No. Nothing. They had water, and that's because going back several kings ago, Hezekiah, he built a. Uh, if you if you remember from Monday Thursday, if I remember, I told you or not. But he built a, uh, a tunnel and, a, and a, a, an underground um, waterway to bring water from outside the city gates from the spring into, and it flowed into the pool of Siloam, which you might remember. Jesus sent somebody to Siloam later on when he was in Jerusalem. So they got water, but that's it. Two years, year and a half without food. How desperate do you think things might have got? <laughs> Pretty bad. Probably the two people eating each other. Jeremiah talks about this in the book of Lamentations. So let's turn there. Lamentations is, well, what is a lament? It's a sorrowful dirge. A lot of times it's poetry or a song. And You'll see Jeremiah's lamenting the situation. He was there for it. Jeremiah witnessed it. So it's poetic, but it describes and it goes beyond what 2 Kings tells us. So Lamentations 4, 5 to 10. Five to 10? Yes, yeah. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those nurtured in purple now lie on ashes. Punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was over overthrown in a moment without a hand turned up her. Their princes were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruddy than rubies, their appearance like sapphires. But now they are blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled down their bones. It has become dry as a stick. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. 
racked with hunger, they waste away for lack of food in the field. With their own hands, passionate women have cooked their own children and obtained their food Ugh. that were destroyed. Pretty bad. We predict them to do great things, aren't we? Good. Those who used to eat delicacies are destitute in the streets. They huddle on garbage heaps, on ashes. Punishment greater than that of Sodom. What happened to the town of Sodom? It was destroyed. Destroyed completely, turned into like a pillar of salt. And here Jeremiah was saying it was better for them because it happened in an instant. This is a year and a half of suffering that comes to this condition before it finally stops. And it's beyond understanding to think of a woman, a mother, cooking her own children just to eat. And it's a compassionate woman. <laughs> Turn it back to Second Kings. What does Zedekiah do? Finally, when it becomes obvious that things are going sour, Christ what does the king do in his army? Christ the Lord. They take off. <laughs> Good luck, folks. You would have liked to at least see him go out and say, hey, we're done. Open the gates and let them come in. Said he takes off and, and leaves everyone. He doesn't get very far, does he? Nope. Says here in this commentary that he was probably hoping to cross over into the town of Moab across the Jordan River. Uh, but in the plains of Jericho, they catch up with him. And what happens to him? Put in shackles. Mm-hmm. Watch the sun skip you. Yeah. And had his eyes to. So, what was the last thing that Zedekiah saw? The sons. The death of his sons. The death of his sons. And then he loses his sight. And then he's marched off to Babylon. Which is real important here because that's the lineage. That's, the, you know, real important to the Jews is uh, 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 tracing the lineage all the way down. And they've destroyed. His kids, his family, the, the, the heirs. The Messianic line. Exactly. The line from David. Yes. Right? One of David's aunts, one of David's descendants was promised to be the king that would reign yeah. uh, in Jerusalem forever. Yes. Yeah. The eternal reign. If you're a Jew, Jew being somebody from Judah, and you're looking at this, what are you thinking? Oops, this is the there in our future. Not just not just are we are we losing the, the messianic promise? Yeah, not just our kingdom, not just this this wonderful land that God has given us, but future. We have screwed up so bad. Seems like the Lord is done with us. Now there was a king that was taken to Babylon. Remember, they took him to Babylon. Keep that in mind. Any other comments, questions? Not done yet. No, and this it's sad, isn't it? It is really, really sad. Uh, let's read now uh, from chapter 25, verses 8 through 12. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. 
and the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, multitude Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be the vine dressers and plowmen. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord and the Chaldeans broke into pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. Okay, we'll stop there. So they catch up with Zedekiah. They put his eyes out. They march him off. Zedekiah's army takes off. March Zedekiah off to Babylon. They come back to Jerusalem and what do they do? Place. Put the hammer down. Done messing with you. The temple? Destroyed. Destroyed. The city? Destroyed. Left in ruins. It talks about burning. Uh, more than likely, the temple, <laughs> the upper portion of it would have been wood. So they burned that. Possibly destroyed some of the foundations, the stone. Definitely destroyed the wall and the homes. All because they didn't listen. Destroying the temple is an important thing, and it would have been important to them. And to understand that, keep your finger here in Second Kings. Let's turn to uh, Jeremiah seven. Jeremiah seven. We're going to read verses uh, four to eleven. This is Jeremiah early on, and he's speaking for the Lord, and he's warning them against doing what exactly is going to come about. So the Lord, plenty of warning to these people, don't do this. Don't fight against Babylon. Don't look to Egypt. And there's an important message here regarding the temple. So Jeremiah 7, 4 through 11. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord. For if you are if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave you of old, to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you still murder, co commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing these abominations. As a house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes, behold, I myself have seen it, says the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Repeated because that kept being the cry of the people. Jeremiah was saying, Babylon's coming, and they're going to put the smack down on it. And so what are the people? How are they responding? God wouldn't do it because it's the temple of the Lord. Oh, his temple's right here. He won't do that. You're crazy, Jeremiah. In fact, we're going to mess with you. We're going to throw you in a, uh, a dry well and leave you there for a while. We're going to put you in shackles to shut you up because we know this won't happen. And Jeremiah told him, yeah, don't trust in the temple. It's a building. And you're going to make God so angry, he will leave. And so why? Yeah. I, don't know. Oh, I was going to say, when, when I was teaching sixth graders, the Concordia had a, a little play that the kids would do. And in this play, there was a mother and a father family. And it was getting really bad in Jerusalem. So they went to the temple. The girl started to cry. And she said, the mother comforted her and said, don't worry, Tamara. We're in the temple. We're safe. Because we're safe in this building. And of course, it was very long ago. But you're right, they thought that the temple was the holy place they would be magically protected. 
There's people that think that about a church too. Oh, Lord. Good analogy, Faith. Good analogy. Yeah, in church, nothing can happen back to me. See. Okay. Notice here verse 11. Does this does this have a familiar ring to it? Yes. Yeah. This house, which is called by my name, has become a den of robbers in your view. Who else have you heard that from? Whose lips? Christ. Yeah. Turn to uh, keep your finger in Second yeah. Kings and turn to Matthew 24. It's not right. Continue 24. It's not 24. 25. It's 20. Cheryl just said 25. He's 25. Uh, 21. 21. Sorry, Matthew 21 verses uh, 12 to 13. Yep. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus quoting Old Testament. How did they make it a den of robbers? Why was it a den of robbers and what was going on? They were, they were selling selling stuff. For, for, and not the best stuff either. They were cheating people. They were like they'd buy they'd buy something off one person and sell it to somebody else's. Well, this isn't very good. It's got all these blemishes, but here this is perfect. So there was buy worship this. going on, but it wasn't the Lord. Who who were they worshiping and what they did? Themselves. Themselves. Make it a profit. And, and the, temp, the part of the temple where they were doing this was the court of the Gentiles. It was a place that God commanded to be set aside so the Gentiles could come and worship and pray to him. And you can't do that very well if there's all this crap going on, is there? So what, what was the result of, of, uh, of, of back in, uh, uh, in Jeremiah? What happened to the temple because of the people's what they were doing in the temple and how they were living their life and how they didn't obey. What did God, what did Babylon come and do? The temple was destroyed. destroyed. This is uh, what Jesus is talking. This is AD 30 something. What's going to happen 40 years later in AD 70 to the temple? They were destroyed. Yeah. Not one stone on another. Yeah. And it still is today. History repeats itself. With the Babylons, that was all a foreshadowing of what would happen. And the people didn't listen. They didn't learn. They didn't turn back to the Lord. They killed his Messiah. They crucified him. What you see, the wailing wall, that was, that's an outer wall. It's not even part of the temple itself. It's an outer retaining wall around the temple court is all that is left. Pastor, is there something then to during Lent when Jesus in, in the confusion among the Jews when Jesus said that this temple will be destroyed and then in three days is there any is, is that a different thread or is there a connection or it was all of this with Christ with, with the church Jesus said church. destroy this temple Yeah, three he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem he was talking, he was about, talking about the, himself, uh, so. the church yes because Christ, when he was there, he was God's presence once again in the temple. The real presence of God returned to the temple when Jesus walked in, because he is the real presence of God. And so when he was crucified, the temple was destroyed, and it was raised up again on Easter. And then at Pentecost, the temple became no longer Jesus, who had ascended back to heaven, but the temple is now you and me. It's the church. Through the dwelling Holy Spirit, we are God's presence in this world. 
So was there more than just the physical destruction that God was talking about when the Jews looked about the destruction of their city, of the temple being destroyed? Was it more to them than the building? Yeah. It should, it, that Once again, that was God's sign. Sacrifices, you don't need to make them anymore. The final sacrifice has been made. You don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore to worship, as Jesus told the lady in Samaria. There will come a time, and it's coming soon, when people will worship, not in Jerusalem, but they'll worship in spirit and in truth, because they will worship with the Holy Spirit who is present with them and gather together as believers. Yeah, that was the big sign. You don't need the temple anymore. We're done with the temple. We're done with Jerusalem being the center of worship. Now the center of worship will be wherever we gather in his name. So this is the center of God's worship right now in this place. Did I ask you a question? Yeah, so it's bigger even back then for the people than, it, than it just a building being destroyed. They needed to know that God is no longer there, but as we read through Ezekiel, you'll find out that God didn't abandon them. God's no longer in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem because that temple's been destroyed, but God is going to leave and follow his people into exile. And he will appear to Ezekiel. Ezekiel has a great vision of the glory of the Lord appearing to him because he stays with his people. He's a merciful God and he doesn't abandon. Back to 2 Kings chapter 25, I believe we need to pick it up with... Uh, um, Verse 13 and read through 21. And the pillars of the bronze that were in the house of the Lord and stands in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans broke in, broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service. The fire pans also in the bowls. What was of gold the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was silver as silver. As for the two pillars in the one sea and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. The weight, the height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, and on its capital of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits. A lattice work and pomegranates of all bronze all were all around the capital, and the second pillar had the same with the lattice work. And the captain of the guard took Sierra, the chief priest of Zavana, Zephaniah, the second priest and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the war, men of war, and five men of the king's council who were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander of the army, who mustered the people of the land, and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city, and Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Rabah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Rabah and in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. I believe Ribla is to the north. It's, it's along the northern border of what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel. That's where he's at. It just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? And you see God working through Nebuchadnezzar. He allows grace. It doesn't just all come at once. He gives them a chance to repent and turn. And as they refuse, it gets worse and worse and worse. Until now, pretty much nothing left, is there? The city's been destroyed. The temple's been destroyed. Most of the people now are taken. The, any articles that were left in the temple of any value are gone. It's cleared out. Think the ark is there anymore? No. Nope. No. But, you know, they couldn't touch the ark without getting killed. So it, it's kind of a mystery of how the ark left. We'll talk about that because we're not done yet. All I know, it's in a warehouse. 
Very good. They watched the movie. Uh, chapter 25, let's read verses 22 to 26. And over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Achim. Yeah. Achim, yep. son of Shepha, governor. And now, now when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, governor, they came with their men at to Gedaliah at Mitzvah. So he's ruling at Mitzvah because he can't rule in Jerusalem anymore. Jerusalem is destroyed. Mitzvah, I believe, is a little bit further north. It's one of the places where uh, the uh, tabernacle uh, that they used in the, um, uh, in the in the wilderness wanderings, I think it, it rested there until the temple was built. So it's been a place where an important place in the past in Israel, and that's where Gedaliah is. Okay. Pick it up there, the second part of 23, Norma. They came with their men to, to get Eliah at Mitzvah, namely Ishmael, son of Nathaniah. They're dead, Norma. Just read them off like you see them. <laughs> Maria, the son of Canhumas, <laughs> the, the Metapathites. And Jazz Naya, the son of Mekathite, and Man. Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because of the Chaldean officials. Live in the land, serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, Son of Ishamah, the royal family, came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, where they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Okay. They still don't learn, do they? <laughs> what little is left, what happens to it? Crushed once again. Jeremiah had given them advice. And to see that, keep your finger here in 2 Kings, turn to Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah is still the prophet that's left uh, here in Jerusalem, in Judah. God's prophetic word to them. Jeremiah 27, let's read verses 1 to 11. This is back during Zedekiah, before it got alive. <laughs> In the beginning of the re reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, make yourself straps and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Send the word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the sons of Ammon, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this charge for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you sh shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth. And I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. How far do you go? Uh, through 11. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with a sword, with famine, and with pestilence, declares the Lord. 
until I have consumed it by his hand. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your fortune tellers, or your sorcerers who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you with the result that you will be removed far from your land and I will drive you out and you will perish. But any nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will lead on its own land to work it and dwell there, declares the Lord. Jeremiah's warning back when Zedekiah was king, they didn't listen. It stood when Gedaliah was there. That's why Gedaliah actually told him. He said, no, it'll be okay. Put yourself under the yoke of Babylon and serve him and we'll be fine. We'll be able to remain here. And here's the Lord's promise. But did they? No. Let's turn back to uh, 2 Kings 25. Don't be afraid, he tells them. Don't be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans where the Babylons live in the land and serve the king and it'll go well for you. But then you have this dude, Ishmael. <laughs> and he's son of, son of, but what's the important part there? He is a member of the royal family, which means he is of the messianic line. With that in mind, Gedaliah is not of the messianic line. Yet he's installed to be a puppet ruler and governor at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So why would Ishmael might want to get rid of him? So he can be in line? He doesn't want this dude ruling, does he? Right. Yeah. Sounds like he would maybe be the next in line, the messianic king of the line. He kills him, and then what does he do? They leave for Egypt. They realize what they've done. Babylon's not going to like this. They're going to come and they're going to be after us. And so Ishmael and his gang and his party, and actually Jeremiah too, they take Jeremiah against his will to Egypt. Now, as far as the uh, ark goes, some people have assumed or said that when Jeremiah was taken, he took the ark with him and hid it somewhere in the uh, the wilderness between uh, Jerusalem and Egypt. There's other stories, and you can find these on YouTube, uh, National Geographic, or in search of one of those kind of stories. Uh, that the ark actually ended up in uh, a country in Africa. I believe it's the one that uh, the queen of uh, Sheba came from. And they actually claim that they have it and that it was dismantled and they formed a drum out of it and they have it in a special uh, sanctuary. And there's other places that in, in Africa that have claimed that they know they have it and it's in this sanctuary and you can't see it, but it's gone. I think it was destroyed. When Babylon came in and they took all of those, if, if it was still there, when Babylon came in and they stripped the temple bare, they took it or they destroyed it. Now, one of you mentioned that they couldn't touch it because if they touch it, they yeah. would die. Mm -hmm. But that's only if the Lord's presence is still. Well, I said the presence of the Lord was gone. And once again, Ezekiel, as we get through, through Ezekiel, you see he has a great vision, which he sees the glory of the Lord descend and leave the Holy of Holies and leave Jerusalem. Gee, I wonder why. Hmm. As you're going back to that section in Jeremiah with the yoke, it's kind of like, well, all this bad stuff, well, it looks like all this bad stuff was happening. And then these false prophets started to come up. And I guess we could call them pundits today too. And they were giving the people an analysis. Maybe Satan was working there and saying, well, you know why all this happened is because of blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And it seems like then God spoke through Jeremiah and says, no, nah, wait a minute, folks. Don't listen to this baloney. The reason this has happened is because of A, B, and C. And God 
the one true God is still in charge. He's letting this happen. So it seems like God had, through Jeremiah, set the record straight. No, no, no. Don't listen to these false prophets. The real reason we're in this mess is because. So I was reading. He was really saying a lot. God wasn't silent there. He spoke up through Jeremiah and said, no, no, no. Don't listen to the, these false prophets. The reason this is happening is because of this. And I am letting Nebuchadnezzar be in power. My will is being done. So I, I really, I was, I, that's why I was quiet for a while. I was saying, man, God sent a strong message there. No, no, no. He's still speaking to the people. He wasn't silent. Yep. I'm sorry, but just, no, that's I true. thought there was a lot in that passage. There is. And it's, that's why I had it there. It's important. You hear God say, hey, I created everything. I created the land. I created the animals. I gave this land to you, people of Israel, people of Judah. I'll give it to whoever I want to. And way back when Moses was there, God told him, if you don't continue to worship me and God alone and follow me, I will take this land from you and I will remove you from it. Moses prophesied that way, way back in Deuteronomy. And now Jeremiah is repeatedly prophesying it. And now it comes true. God clearly says Babylon is here because I'm allowing it. He, they are my servant and God will use Faithful people and unfaithful people. And when he uses evil, wicked people like Babylon, you know it's bad. If that's who he's using to destroy you, that's an exclamation mark on his anger and his wrath over your disobedience and your faithlessness. So Jeremiah is saying, let's, through God, let's set the record straight here, folks. There's a lot of confusion going on as to why is all this happening. Don't fight against them because you can't. Not only is Babylon far stronger than you, but the Lord is using them. If you stand against Babylon, you're standing against the Lord God, and he will destroy you. And he did. And just time and again, do you see each of these stages, the Lord is giving the people that are left the chance to repent, to stop, to turn back to him, to be obedient. Forget the dream that you're going to have this kingdom, and it's going to be yours, and you're going to rule in the way that uh, Israel did when David was king. That's God. <laughs> But he's still giving them a gracious chance, and they each time turn away from him. They don't listen. They disobey, and it keeps getting worse and worse. So we're about at the lowest, lowest part now, aren't we? It's a sort of tale, isn't it? It's a sad tale. You think back to what Israel was when David was ruling and when Solomon was ruling. They were the superpower of the area at that time, and all the other nations were come, and they would make treaties with them, and they would bring stuff, and they helped build a, a beautiful palace for David and a beautiful temple in, in uh, Jerusalem. Now it's all gone. But we're left on a, on, a, on a one little bright note. And let's finish off uh, chapter 25, 2 Kings 25, and read uh, 27 to 30. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merida, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. For his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. <laughs> so how does Second King then? No, no. Especially for Jehoiakim, right? But once again, there's this messianic promise. And how does this, what happens here, give a note of hope as far as the messianic promise is concerned? Where is the Messianic crown flowing and through whom right now? So yeah. He's released from prison. He's dining at the king's table. Is there still hope left? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. God has not forgotten them. God has not given up on them. Comments or questions? I do. Just so I can get this in my head. 
all while this is happening, you're saying that Daniel is still in Babylon? Daniel went early. Yep. Okay. So he went er yeah, early on, but he still is witness to. He's not witness only prophetically. Only he's, prophetically. he's not there in Jerusalem. No. Nope. The only true prophet whose eyes, physical eyes are there watching this happen is Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah. Yeah. As we'll find out, and we'll break into this uh, when we come back and actually dig into the study next week. Um, Daniel was gone in one of those early first waves when Nebuchadnezzar came and took the best and the brightest. Okay. Ezekiel was taken at that time, too. So the only prophetic word, there might have been a couple other prophets, but the one that we have is Jeremiah. He was left in Jerusalem. So Daniel is in one spot in Babylon, and Ezekiel's in another spot. They're the voices of God's people in Babylon. So... So Daniel did not see the destruction he prophesied. I don't think Daniel's talks, he has more kind of. Daniel's prophecy is more in regards to Nebuchadnezzar and the kings that are there. God's word speaking to them. And he does have some end times. He does talk about beyond Babylon. He actually has some prophecy about the Greeks coming and the Greek uh, um, uh, um, generals that will rule after them and even all the way to Rome. He prophesied Rome coming in and, and taking over the promised land. Is Ezekiel, uh, from his, even though he doesn't witness it, the Lord gives him the prophetic word. He's the one that informs and tells the, the, the Jews in Babylon, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. <laughs> and they didn't want to hear that. And you'll see Ezekiel, he does kind of children's messages. He not only Prophesies with his mouth, but he acts it out. He's the one that informs the Jews that are in exile, this is happening. And so it's a word of law. And it's a word of warning to them. This is what's going to happen. And the word to them is, turn back to the Lord here, now. And then after Jerusalem is destroyed, he pronounces it. And then his prophetic word kind of changes more to a word of hope. The Lord has not forgotten. The Lord is still with you. And there will be a time when you will get to go back home. Questions? Anyone else? Comments or questions? A lot of history. Had you ever read this, this, this part? Have you ever studied this? Does it ring a bell at all? No. Just some crossovers from other Bible studies. Yeah. You kind of talked about Jerusalem being destroyed, but uh, these are a lot of passages we've never really looked into, and they're interesting to see what happened. And when you think about it, and uh, I did this in another study, I think we actually, we looked outside of the Bible, uh, because in the Bible, there's it, it, we see references to Jerusalem being destroyed by the Romans. But really, you get an account by uh, Josephus, who was a Jewish uh, historian and scholar who was alive and writing at that time. He gives a great description of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And, and what happened with Babylon foreshadows that. And the Romans was even worse. When Jesus was carrying his uh, cross, and he stopped and said to the woman, women, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. But there will come a time when people will wish that they didn't have their children and they'll be running off and mountains fall on us and cover us. He was speaking of this Roman destruction of Jerusalem. Because they, just like the people in, in Jeremiah's time, thought that they could stand up and fight against Rome. And the prophecy was there. No, God put them in power over you. Come underneath them. Obey them. I mean, Rome let the Jews worship as they want, but they thought that they could be free. And that, that destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans foreshadows the coming destruction of this entire world on the last day. Just as nothing was left standing of the temple, everything you know now as reality. 
on the last day will be gone. Rome hasn't been destroyed. What's that? Am I correct to say that Rome really hasn't been destroyed? And I'm kind of thinking back to Daniel's prophecy about the statue. Other powers have come. There, yeah. there, there are new Romes. In fact, you can look. There is a lot of correspondence between the United States of America and Rome. We're not the Christian country that people like to think that we are. And uh, I, I would love to see the United States stand until Jesus returns, but that's not that's not promised in the Bible. At least not the country that you maybe grew up in and I grew up in, and it's no longer that now anyway, is it? That's gone. Put not your trust in princes who are mortal and die. Put your trust in the Lord. What he does promise is that the church will still remain. The gates of hell will not prevail against it up until the last day. We as the church, whether we're worshiping in a building like this or we're meeting in somebody's home, whether we're hiding, word and sacrament worship will continue in some way, shape, or form until Jesus returns. But now that we have the freedom to study God's word, let's do it. Because it might become, even in our lifetime, harder and harder and harder. A great example of that was what just happened. And I talked about this in worship a while back. And that's this new addition to the civil rights law. Where they're forcing uh, all entities in Michigan to recognize the rights of transgender and homosexuals and how does that stand as far as us as a church and what we believe and confess if there's no exception for the church our stand as the lcms is not having gay pastors or transgender pastors <clears throat> would come under fire by the state of michigan Our decision not to marry same-sex couples would come under fire. Under fire meaning that we could lose our tax-exempt status. Pastors could be hauled off to jail. Do you see it happening in Canada? There's Canadian pastors who are protesting outside these libraries where they're having um, drag queen presentations for children in libraries in Canada, and pastors are standing outside preaching God's word, and being arrested. Now, they're using a law that says that uh, you can't have protests within a certain distance of these libraries, but there's other people protesting out there and speaking for the drag queens. They're not being arrested. Hmm. It's coming. And it's not that far away. It's just across the border from us. And I asked once before, and maybe we should uh, mention it again, pray. Pray that the Lord would continue to work through the courts and keep some kind of protection for us as a religious entity. And it's not just the Christian church. It's Muslims and other organized religions are all against us. We have our Revelation study tonight. and. Uh, those of you that have been part of it, are these things coming true? Do we talk about in Revelation? Yes, they are. More about that tonight. Any final comments or questions before we break for the day? Thank you all for joining me. I hope this was uh, not just, uh, I mean, I, did, I didn't want it to be um, History for history's sake. I hope it means something to you because uh, out of all these things, that's why Jesus came is to redeem us from this mess. Don't look to politicians to save you. Jesus has already come to save you. Regardless of what happens to this country, Christ's redemption is sure. Our resurrection is sure. And in eternal life, all of these problems will go away. This world will go away, but it's a sinful, broken world that just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But eternal life, all of this will be gone, and Jesus will be there, and you'll be there, and I'll be there.
and it'll be some kind of fantastic that we can't even imagine or realize right now. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for opening our eyes to what happens when your people rebel against you, when they don't listen to your prophetic word. But even though this was just really horrible to read, over and over again, we see your grace and your mercy. You kept giving people a chance to return and come back to you. And you're allowing us right now to preach your word of law and preach your word of gospel, to call out to those who have turned away from you, to call them back through their baptism, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and to keep us, each one of us that have turned back to you and are in faith towards you, you work to keep us in that faith, to keep us looking at our sin and looking back at our Savior, to trust in him alone to be right with you, knowing that we are declared right with you, no matter how we act during the day, during our lives, your forgiveness is constant and assured. Be with this church. May we always be place that proclaims your wonderful gospel. Protect us from the actions of those outside the humans that the devil is working through to try to oppress us and silence our voice. May we always be proclaimers of your law and your gospel of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Those of you that uh, were part of the Revelation study, and even those of you who weren't, uh, 7 o'clock tonight, right here in this place. Right. See you at lunch. See you at lunch, brother. Jill, thanks yep. for joining us. Thanks. Our old hometown. <laughs> Reverend Art's got his hand. Yeah. I'm ready to go. Wait for I want to see the new restaurant. There we go. Have a great day, everybody.